this is an important topic. It's a topic that maybe is not something necessarily we spend time thinking about, particularly the role of the people that are caring for those who are actually sick and unwell, you know, in the busyness of our days, um, and the peculiarity sometimes of the people that are in those caring roles, often pushed into those caring roles by circumstance, um, we may or may not um, see them as part of the healthcare kind of um, continuum. Now, for small regional places, you may indeed have um, the same family group or the same friends who are supporting people as part of your practice. But often people may, as part of their history, be seeing different practices or different practitioners or being involved. So sometimes it's, it gets quite complicated around this area. And then, of course, the way in which people are supported in the caring environment may indeed lead to uh, the successful, I guess, in the sense, stepping into the loss and grief phases of care, which obviously isn't a fine dividing line. There's a preemptive kind of grief and loss um, that people are beginning to operationalise when they're seeing their loved ones deteriorating. But then it's how that journey has gone, as we mentioned yesterday, which leads then to how maybe successfully they move back into integrating the loss of their loved one um, into their sort of well-being and so forth. So in many ways, palliative care, like a lot of healthcare, has a public health, population health um, uh, outcomes. And this is very much in the domain of not only looking after the person who's unwell, but looking after the family carer group as well. And as you know, uh, well know, um, carer health becomes a real issue often in the um, time frames that people are deteriorating and dying. Now we've most probably all been, or maybe we haven't, been carers at some stage or had a caring role. Um, and also we've most probably all had losses at some stage. And if you feel able to share any of those sorts of you know, stories or anecdotes or things that maybe you, has come up for you as much as for your patients, I'm happy if we, while we're taking a more informal sort of approach. I think it's also important, um, I'll share a little bit of my story when I was sort of pushed into the um, caring role and some of the then elements of grief, um, just to give a context to the reality that we're living every day often um, in this space. As I mentioned yesterday, so I don't need to, we can do a bit of a skip. <laughs> Six, minus one, now minus two, you're down to the four. Um, really it is to understand the challenges. Now we're very lucky at the Centre for Palliative Care. Our director, um, Professor Peter Hudson, has actually led an international collaborative for a number of years. His beginning research was on the family caregiver and the issues to do that. So over his 20 years of research, he's really headed up a lot of work in bringing the issues of family carers to the front and centre. For many years it sat in the background and wasn't really kind of talked about in a huge amount of way, but now it's become a very popular part and he leads the collaborative which meets uh, every couple of years at the European Association of Palliative Care. So it's got quite a significant international platform, which is, which is great to see. So it's hard by association not to be kind of swamped with the kind of latest and greatest research um, in the carer role. Also, I think it's important, and I think some of the people who are doing, I think, um, doing our, our specialist and graduate certificates at the University of Melbourne um, touch on some of these elements in much more detail over the sort of two-year program that they um, sit with in their training. OK, so what I'm just interested to hear um, what um, what we think, what do you know? What do, what do people know about the sort of carer role? What are some of the things that might be important in your practice to be thinking about um, in this space? It seems like they dealt with the, yeah. with the role that, they, that they're not ready for. Yeah. Uh, and, and to make it easier for them if it's a big part of Yeah. To, to educate those carers because it's, there's, there's, just, there's a lot of different emotions involved 
there. Uh, yeah. A lot of issues come up that wasn't there in the motion. Yeah. That's the difficult one. Yeah. So any other thoughts? But that's as absolutely important. I think the word dumped came into my mind when I was actually asking the question that often people have. Sometimes it's very incremental, so it starts off as just supporting by going to a, a patient's consultation or coming in to see the doctor at the same time, or, but then it sort of becomes incremental. Others, it kind of lands fair and squarely very quickly on their front doorstep just by the nature of um, somebody becoming acutely unwell and taking it from there. So. Yeah. Yeah. And Yeah. So a lot of issues around self-doubt, um, awareness that maybe they're doing a good enough job, that maybe they're taking the brunt of the kind of emotional distress that a patient's feeling. Um, we heard from your question yesterday just the you know, sometimes it's a conflict. It feels like a conflictual kind of relationship, or maybe their relationship issues spill out in this very sort of difficult time. You know, so the potentially the relationship issues, if they're husband and wife or partner and partner, can become quite tricky and difficult. And I'm talking about the female thing, but the male relationship. Yes, 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 and there's and there's that as well. So sometimes it's not just a shared responsibility of one person, it becomes a collective and as you know um, we all take different attitudes and understandings um, into that space. So the closer it gets towards dying we often find you know some people take uh, more significant roles than others in this space and, and for, for families that are collaborative they can find that place. Where there's difficulties is when um, problems crop up because they are conflictual behind the scenes or at the bedside. I mean, you know, I have seen the, the best and the worst of families um, over the years, and I'm sure you've seen the best and the worst. The thing about being in a regional centre and in a more rural centre and, and potentially remote is really the caring is very much dependent on that grouping of coming together. We rely very heavily on the work that carers do. Um, you know, many people couldn't be supported at home if it wasn't for some sort of care network that centred around them. Now, obviously, the community nursing, community care, community palliative care services can be part of that equation. And certainly with things like NDIS and My Age Care, once you can navigate the systems, um, they can be quite a significant component to the care delivered and the support delivered. I don't know how much exposure you guys are getting to NDIS kind of coming into play for the patients that are under 65, but it's, it's starting to make a significant impact for many of our sort of chronically unwell patients or neurodegenerative patients and so forth. Um, but negotiating the system is, is one of the issues. Okay. Um, in my own journey, my partner got sick five years ago um, very suddenly, and I was sort of forced into um, the caring role for about two months. And unfortunately, over that period, it was deterioration and, and his death. But what was, in, what was important for me was that my workplace said, you need to be in that role. They gave me permission to not keep working, to take carer's leave, and to sort of... So in many ways, I was able to sort of embrace the caring role, whatever that meant, but... Um, I had a very supportive workplace at, at the, in the hospital, but that's not always true. You know already that people's incomes can be stretched if the you know, person who's sick is maybe a, a more significant breadwinner, earner of money, and then the carer has to then kind of navigate. And, and we've all had examples of people losing their job, not having enough um, sick leave, all those sorts of things that can happen. So there can be a lot of social consequence in this space. We also know the couples, as they're getting towards um, their sort of older age, they're supporting each other, sort of the TP tent holding each other up. And then unfortunately, one becomes unwell and the sort of the cohesion falls apart. So you're sort of scrabbling to sort of support two people um, at the same time. I don't know if you've got any comments 
height. I suppose, I suppose from the, the caring side of things, because I know I looked after my mother for seven years um, before she died, and even though I'm a nurse, and even though I was working in palliative care, I wasn't prepared fully for the caring role of somebody that close to me. Yeah. Um, because I would go into nurse mode when I was doing all the physical care and such like, and then I would go home and know. Yeah. So even those families amongst your patients who have nurses, doctors within their families, they need as much, if not maybe a little bit more care because they beat themselves up for not being able to cope. I think it's right, giving them permission that it is okay if they can't manage it. Yeah. And when they think they've had the, you know, the nursing role or the medical background, I think the other thing that comes into play in many, again, many cultures, is expectations placed on people in relationships. <laughs> Breakfast too. My <laughs> yeah. <laughs> great. Okay. As we said yesterday, and it's great we've got the, the same uh, audience, so I, I don't need to go through this, but really just as a bit of a reminder that, you know, the caring role can be, as you know, people have got chronic respiratory problems, chronic whatever, sort of organ failure, maybe quiet deterioration, maybe it's frailty related to older age. Um, you can really see that it can be a long, long journey. And you can imagine trying to support people over many um, weeks, months, years, um, can in sense take its toll on the, the relationships, can take its toll on the um, ability of people to be present to the issues. Um, often you find when people have certain sort of personality constructs, maybe they don't want to accept the support that you're trying to provide. And that can cause issues as well. We often get these, we've got a person at the moment who is um, you know, extremely isolated and, and has relied very much on uh, neighbours to be the kind of go-to point and unfortunately has worn out the neighbours um, but so remains very isolated but he's deteriorating to a point we need specialist palliative care to be involved but he's not allowing anybody else in except a small group of people he's come to trust in the health care from St Vincent's who go out on the road to see people at home. So that puts a lot of pressure on the professional carers as much as being able to support him at home and quite adamantly refusing to go anywhere else other than his home. So sometimes it can be a very, very, um, very difficult journey. And this is a journey the care team has been looking after this person for, you know, three or four years in this place. So, um, but then again, you get the issues that sometimes when it is very short, sharp, um, people don't really get an opportunity to kind of embrace that role, but are left with the legacy afterwards um, in the grief and loss that they experience. We talked yesterday about the congruency between what people would like, um, what, is, what are their preferences, what do people want, what do families want, what do healthcare professionals want, what do patients want, and the congruency between the first three, uh, particularly around you know, making sure that people's preferences. So there is, a, there is a sense of wanting to do the best by the person who is unwell, trying to make sure that um, they meet their needs and expectations. Now, you know as well that that can be broader. Sometimes there's community expectations, and that might be through church or a faith group or a cultural group. And that's a, that's a, hard, that's a hard journey to take sometime when the, the sort of community expectations um, are overlaid. Um, I often watch um, people in our, we, we have a, quite a large uh, a, a Greek population that, in our catchment and I'm quite amazed sometimes about those, those expectations that can ripple out during the, the caring and also puts a huge burden on the carers to meet the sort of community expectations and criticism that that carer gets by the community for not being something that the community thinks they should be. And, um, and then after the death, that sort of um, isolation remains. 
Um, we've seen that happen a couple of times with maybe a person who's dying bringing up a sister dying right at the end of their life and um, the ripple effect that's been going on after the death. But I think it is important, and again, as there is this sort of differentiation between what the family and carers want versus what the um, patient wants. Okay, we talked about that yesterday. But what's important is that this is a very, I think this is quite a nice way of looking at it, and you can draw this out, the journey of the carer. There are a lot of things going on for the carer, and, and um, irrespective of the person but really, as you said, they're thrust into the role and the, the fluctuation of grief and loss, it may not be acknowledged prior to the deterioration or the death, or it may be. They may come and see you as a consultation and you're able to start to unpack. Because all, all the issues that the sick person is feeling are most probably the same sorts of issues and problems that the um, carer is feeling as well. And particularly the escalations of a sense of grief and loss that can fluctuate and obviously becomes um, absolutely overt, um, obviously as the person is nearing death and then death occurs. There's a huge pressure for that person to feel like they've done a, a good job. There's huge pressure to feel like they've done their best and that's going to be acknowledged. And that's very important. Certainly um, patients often want to feel safe and valued and often it falls to the carer to somehow be demonstrating that. I think also, obviously, care for oneself. We're, we're all taught in medical school, and we see it, you see it every day in your practice, how the care of the, care of the carer, their own self-care, their own management of their medical problems or their psychosocial problems, issues, um, often takes a back seat. And how often do we meet people who both die in you know, the death occurs of the loved one and 12 months later, the other person's died at the same time. It's a very common phenomenon um, that we certainly see. Um, we often start to see, you know, we've had one person die with us and then the next person in that family um, comes into that space as well. So I think it's a good representation that not only can the grief continue, and that can continue Often it's 12, 13 months. If you're looking at integrating, I mean, grief can be life long afterwards, and there's a lot of, again, cultural expectations to be demonstrating grief overtly. But I think, you know, often about the 12, 13 months mark is kind of when that integration back into um, kind of, I guess, a perspective that looks um, different. But for many people, we meet many people who are unreconciled, and we'll go into that a little bit later, um, and quite determinedly angry at the system or whatever it is that has left people. So most carers, when they're looking back, so um, palliative care services, I'm sure our services provided here um, in the region here, do, under their remit, provide some sort of ongoing support, often for 12, 13 months. I'm, not, I'm, I'm assuming that's in your remit. Um, to the carers, whoever identified as the main carers. So you may not be aware of that in your practice, but it's certainly something that continues. Um, and certainly over that time, even though the actual dying time is, is difficult and it might be traumatic and there's a lot of emotion, when they start to look back, um, people see it. So a lot of the studies look at the, the immediacy of the death, the three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, um, 15 months. But certainly by the sixth month, people start to see the caring experience as a very positive experience. And I, I used an example yesterday of um, you know, people who've completely traumatised our team by their behaviour prior to the death, coming back to us and just you know, glowingly talking about the care that they had. And we're all standing there still two years later feeling a bit traumatised and still talking about the same case. You know, the patients you never forget, um, I'm sure, you know, you never forget some of these people because they're quite damaging. As I mentioned before, though, there is absolutely where things can be quite divergent is this whole notion of who are we looking after in the dying time? We're looking after the patient, but really we're looking after the living at the same time. And there's this sort of transition. So for about 35%, of, there's a divergence around where that location of care 
should be. And that's important to understand that even though the person who's unwell might be saying, I want to die in place, I want to die at home, I want to be at home, often you'll find there is a divergence. And it's, it's absolutely worthwhile asking people about that um, and giving them an opportunity to express their views about their, and often it's the fears and anxieties of doing a good job, not necessarily knowing what to do, not knowing who's going to support them to do that job, uh, and, and acknowledging that they've got a significant role in this, in this place. And as I said yesterday, uh, about 30% of people would meet the criteria six months out of post-traumatic stress, um, but by sort of 15 months, that's certainly diminished. So the caring experience, even though 60% can be very positive, it, it can still be traumatising for people. And I'll, I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. So from the research, um, so when we support carers and it's, it's overt, it's known, and again, the palliative care crew can talk to this, I'm sure, it's both the patient and the carer benefit from it. Um, as I mentioned, the, the congruency of things that make it a, a good death is around this sort of relationship kind of thing that, that the benefits aren't just for the carer. If you take time to talk to the carer and see what their needs are, maybe separately or together, often separately, it's the letterbox conversation that you have on the way out from the home visit. I did one of the home visits I did yesterday, just having the GP walked up from their clinic at the same time. And it, and it was really important that the person, the younger person who's got, I talked about the glioblastoma, the sister was able to come out and talk to us uh, at the letterbox. So we got to hear what was really pressing for them at that particular time. So sometimes it's very informal, but it's, it's a kind of classic kind of way. And that you've all met patients, I think, who are a bit care, um, controlling of the carer having that opportunity to come and talk about that. The, <coughs> the patient that doesn't want you to leave their side and so the, the carer feels obligated to not kind of express their need. So often we need to think about drawing the, the person caring or the majority of carers um, away and, do a, and separately ask about their particular needs. And I'll come back to that as well. So I think it is important to understand that the outcomes, all those things that we talk about, the um, less of the, the mood issues, less depression, less kind of um, less um, ignoring their own health issues, um, most probably surround about this sort of benefits of understanding what care and needs are about. Is this something that people have thought about? I mean, you guys, um, it's your day-to-day -day sort of practice, but um, and maybe in the capacity building, it's been part of that equation. In a small community, some people vicariously feel supported because, as you know, suddenly there'll be people helping uh, um, the house, you know, they'll come and do that, the looking after the garden if it's known that somebody's sick, or somebody will come and deliver food, or somebody might help with the kids being picked up and dropped off. So sometimes communities will, and again, this family I saw yesterday, I mean, really, the community in Beechworth has kind of just swamped these people um, with sort of attention and love and kind of trying to provide support for them, you know, from the pharmacist um, making special calls to you know, all sorts of people. So it's quite significant sometimes. And so often I think in rural, regional communities, it's often a much stronger kind of vibe. Um, now, unfortunately, if you've got somebody who's got difficult personality issues, it doesn't always play out that kind of way. So from the research, um, as I said, it's mainly around the cost. And we mentioned some of these things, um, you know, the isolation, um, pressures. The people who've taken a very subordinate role in a relationship, um, suddenly a thrust into making a whole lot of decisions that might be financial, might be sort of related to estates. Um, even for myself as a carer, I never recognised, I'd never looked after anyone, um, obviously in the dying time, but just going through the estate stuff was an absolute nightmare. I had no idea it was going to be so layered and problematic and and every time you rang someone, they had a different opinion. And every time you went online, you could see them at, at their desk. Suddenly they've got the, 
you could hear it in their voice. Oh no, he's mentioned dying and death. They sort of get the, the formulary up on their screen, just, you know, and suddenly the empathetic tone shifted. Um, and I always remember, I must have got a call centre in overseas somewhere and the, the person on the end of the phone started crying. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, core, <laughs> this is, you know, so <laughs> it was very unhelpful to be constantly reminded of these things, but it was interesting just how difficult these sorts of things can be. Um, I have to say, my, again, my experience was, rel you know, in the difficulty of it all, was very positive. And, and what surprised me, but it, it took me about six months to recognise how positive that was. Um, so that's my own experience. Um, you know, the actual death was traumatising, even though death actually wasn't traumatising, wasn't a difficult death. It was a, a sort of what you would see as a sort of uh, um, a good death. I think. But what was interesting for me was, um, and I recognised this, was the how if you've got a relatively cohesive relationship, how intimate the time was. So that time when you have to go and wash somebody, or that time when you have to um, maybe shave somebody, or that time when you have to kind of, you know, kind of shift people around the house and do those sorts of things. I actually in retrospect, found it extremely intimate. And that's something that people don't necessarily talk about. We always talk about the difficult stuff. But actually, that's, for me, that was a very great experience to carry forward uh, in remembrance, that it was such an intimate um, and, in fact, you know, a very proximal time sort of working through these things. I don't know if that was with your mother at all or... <laughs> yeah, so it's a surprise. No one talks about it. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so it, it shouldn't always be seen as a, a, a difficult kind of time. Okay. That, sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm going backwards. Okay. But I think you've raised it already. There's lots of gaps, isn't there? We're not born, we're not born to be carers. We, I mean, we take on caring roles. You know, it might be with children, it could be with pets, it could be with your partner. Um, you know, when guys get the colds and flus, we need a lot of care and attention. Um, but I think this is important. So somebody has to take a role to really start to unpack this because the more you can enhance the carer's ability, the more likelihood they're going to feel like they've had a successful and able time. And we find this all the time, don't we? It's often we just assume they're going to take on the role. We assume that they somehow can navigate the system. They assume that they're willing. They're willing to um, take on the roles. And often, as you said, there's a lot of resentment can come up their life. Maybe they were, uh, we saw a young 28-year-old, um, 28, 26-year-old 28, um, woman yesterday and her partner. And they're very, I think I mentioned they're very millennial kind of, way of working in the world and they've got their little Google device that they ask questions of when we're recommending drugs and you know, it's a whole new world out there. Um, so it was quite interesting, but to see them, uh, you know, very supportive husband having to cope with somebody at this age where obviously their life trajectory was going that way until about three months ago and it's really taken a kind of very difficult journey. Um, but trying to get them alone, separate, to actually ask the carer what's going on for you, how are you managing, is quite difficult as well. Because again, I think he sees his role as providing the, the hopefulness. Uh, you know, so there's a kind of a, we're focusing on the battle, we're focusing on the journey, we're, we're focusing on the positivity of things. Um, so it was up to me, I think, in that meeting to say, this is a difficult time. These are difficult things that are happening, the, you know, to the, to the collective. Um, and not to make it all a bit of a downer for them, but to really give a sense that we need to, and even said, look, we're really hoping with the new radiotherapy that you're having, that things are going to stabilise. And, and I'm hopeful they will, because um, so I convey that hope. But I said, we just need to talk about that, this difficult stuff that's going on for the patient. But we need to know you know, how's that affecting you? He looked exhausted and, you know, so we sort of opened the door and I think it's up to 
us as healthcare professionals to open those doors sometime and not leave them kind of closed. Okay. So it's all about preparedness. Um, I guess as medical practitioners and nurses um, and others, we never thought we'd always be teachers, um, but it's a huge part of our role, isn't it? And I think this is one area where it's worthwhile taking a little bit of time to um, think about how we can help to teach carers. Now, they don't need to go back to school. They don't need to um, get a certificate to say, I'm, I'm a good carer. Um, maybe people are a bit sort of OCD and focused. That's an important thing to do. But really, some of the most basic things about how you give medication, um, we just assume people know what to do. We assume people know, you know how they can um, uh, carefully put out their different medicines, how we assume people know that they need to store certain medications away from children or in cupboards or the open, you know, we just assume uh, so much about these things and, and don't think to raise them. And I think obviously having a team like the Community Connecting Palliative Care team or group of people to take those roles makes a big difference because, you know, for, for GPs you can raise certain things but you're not everything to everybody and it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is the difficulty when a, a patient says, I don't want anyone coming into the house. Um, and so we often use the argument that, look, we're, we're trying to support your husband, wife, partner in this. So really, it, I, we understand that you don't feel this is for you, but we need to make sure that they can continue to do the job that you're hoping them to do. So, so you can stay at home or you can whatever, you know. So sometimes it is a little tricky. Um, and again, the trusted GP can sometimes open that door for people and introduce the relationships and so forth. Um, I don't know if people have had that sort of experience, those experiences where as hard as you try, it doesn't happen. It's, it's a tricky, tricky space to be. And the two things about um, education, I think, is one is about, you know, kind of giving you a sense of what skills might be needed to look after somebody. And the other one is really how they can take care of themselves. And the compassionate community work that I think somebody mentioned yesterday from the PHN, is that part of the palliative care program? It's, it's part of our um, project, upskilling um, communities to when they do find themselves in a care role, they might already be doing some just sort of general caring that they feel confident in to support their loved one, but they feel confident into also tapping into their natural support networks. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, and getting people to realise you don't do that. You do need to do that and you need to do it early so that you can keep going. Yeah. Yeah, so trying to change that mindset that I need to do it all myself um, we need to do it with others. Yeah. So people are aware of the compassionate community programs. It's quite a significant part of palliative care development in the last few years. Um, is that across the PHN or is it? Um... Uh, our project has made a significant part, but other PHNs, um, some haven't done it at all. Yeah. So it's very in pockets across Australia. Yeah. But within the region here, it's quite within a. Within the region, we've, we've, we've done it in. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a huge undertaking doing that community development work and getting communities to think about death and dying when they're like, not real keen on it <laughs> until they have to. So it's a parenting yeah. space yes. that was well worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, these are relatively new features in the system. And again, um, often with the NDIS and, um, and My Age Care, if you successfully navigate that, again, often it, the carer needs are as important to be focusing on as well. But I think even taking time to sort of just, even though they may not listen and take you up on it, is really to talk about their own self-care as well. 
in that particular arena. Okay. And again, just to say that really, some of these are some of the things that we need to work through. One is around their understanding and knowledge, um, knowledge of the actual illness itself, um, knowledge of the situation that's unfolding. We talked about family meetings or coming together to have a common understanding. Um, one is the medication utilisation. Um, I'm always a bit, it's always surprising when you go to see a palliative care patient and they're maybe on one, just taking Panadol or something. And it's so nice and refreshing that you don't have to spend a whole lot of time focusing on medications. But as we know, a lot of people are kind of, um, often there's a multi-layering of in their chronic illness and their, so there's a lot of deprescribing often has to happen. So taking family members through that process of withdrawal of medicines or things they've been utilising for a number of years is, is also part of that. But one of them is getting them to understand that what, you know, their, understand their preconceptions of what dying is about. Um, again, we talked about the patient's preconceptions yesterday, um, but we need to understand the carers because they may have the same fears, anxieties, um, concerns, which is driving them to either um, be rattling the can for ongoing treatment or, or ignoring the issues because it means they've got to face the mortality of their loved one and kind of understand that for themselves. So really we've got to, oh, no, no, or someone, uh, really, um, and someone, they do have to become like the medical manager in a sense. They have to, um, I used to get people, I had a folder, I was, I'm not a very big organised person, I'm a bit of a big picture kind of brush stroke person, but I had a folder and any time anyone rang me and said, what can I do to help? I said, well, at the moment, there's, there isn't anything, but I'll write your name down and you're, at some point I'll ring you when there's a uh, thing that I might need to um, be helped with. And that was even, for some people, that was after uh, my partner's death that I would ring them and say, look, you remember telling me that you wanted to help me in something. I've, there's something I think you could help me with, recognising what they did or their role or their skills um, and so forth. I was very fortunate. One of my close friends who was a pal um, obviously working in the sector uh, was able to f come down from somebody who'd retired, came down from northern New South Wales and was able to take on a kind of day-to-day nursing role. Initially we thought that might be for a few weeks but really ended up being only for a, uh, about a week. But it was pivotal, pivotal in sharing the burden of um, this thing. But it was identify some, you know, people offering but then accepting the help that people were offering. I think that was important as well. Okay. So this is the easy list, isn't it? This is the list of all the things that we have to you know, and it's not that we have to work through these things. We, it's just that carers are as complex as the patients that we're often looking after. So the people who have difficult and traumatised lives are highly likely to have, you know, other people that are around their circle of um, care that might also have the difficult and traumatised lives. The mental health issues that draw kind of people together at similar times. Um, maybe their life journey from countries where it's been difficult with war and, and we know all, this, you know all the things that are playing out in the world at the moment. I'm, I'm often, you know, often apprehensive about the world because we just create trauma everywhere. And, and at some point when they come to Australia, they're going to have to be part of looking after somebody who's dying from these very traumatised kind of backgrounds and so forth. But these are the sort of things we're coping with and how often in our population, we're actually, you know, dealing with all the issues around um, unresolved issues within the family construct. Um, and that could, as you said, there's quite a big, kind of big list uh, there. One of the ones we often struggle at St Vincent's is when there are addiction issues in a family and often the people that support that addiction come hovering and see a role in still supplying kind of drugs and things at a time when they're impatient and things. So we have a, we have a, I know if people have never been to some V's in Melbourne, we've got a pond out the front of the hospital and we call it pond life. 
and because that's where all the drug dealing goes on in these. Uh, we have to have sniffer dogs come around once a week and all sorts of things. But I mean, they're real things. You know, the addiction stuff is important, and those they're still important friends to these people. But and and they will take on caring roles sometimes. Um, but it's trying to sort of mitigate the risks that that brings with them sometimes. Okay. One of the, and I've, we've mentioned this already, and I think really this is a shared responsibility. Um, I think the care of the multidisciplinary team in helping, uh, when I say multidisciplinary, it's, it's having a broader group that can connect with somebody. It could be as simple as in Shepparton where they have the community op shop that somebody just pops in them out. Um, it could be that there's some functions that are organised for a particular family. Um, you know, you often hear if it's a child who's in the end of life phase or something's happened, that fa community will come together and do a fundraiser or do something else. Um, but I really do think this is one avenue that, as we said, being maybe time poor and busy, it's not the sort of thing that always feels it's the right place for, the say, the GP. It needs a broader uh, reach. And as we know, there are many places um, where this sort of caring role takes its shape. Um, were you, your caring role, was that mainly in the community with your mum or was it... Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moment of grief and loss. So one of the things about caring is, you know, like everything, people have developed ass assessment tools, and I'm not saying, but this actually has been a very influential. I'm not sure if it's integrated into everyone's systems. It's very difficult to think, why do I have to rely on a particular tool or toolkit? But really, this is one tool that has actually made quite a significant difference to actually give the voice of the carer. We've redesigned our um, uh, admission form so that we have a separate page for the carer and their needs, you know, identifying who they are, who are their support, but also what's important to them um, at this particular time. Are there any health issues that we need to be aware of? Are there, because I think it gives a legitimate voice to the carer, just melding it all into place in one kind of um, admission or discussion doesn't, I think, um, augur well. With the care team, because we are, have access to um, pastoral care workers, spiritual care, music therapists, I mean, we've got the sort of, you know, um, kind of, quite a diverse group of people, volunteers, those team members are for the carer as much as for the patient. So often the benefits of care isn't just for the patient, it's the multidisciplinary team connects with both carers um, and the patient at the same time. But this is actually a quite a, um, this is really a simple tool. It's designed in like a lot of these things in the UK, um, but I don't know if, this is something that people use, um, again, just stepping south of the New South Wales border, um, certainly in the West Hume, they've really integrated it well. And you hear staff speaking of the benefits of having some very simple assessment process um, around the carer. Um, and it's not very onerous at all. It's really just asking, and what you do is you give it to the, you can give it to the actual carer and get them to self-identify at that particular time, and it's a kind of simple way of um, getting them their voice without kind of giving them too much pressure to. Um, but it's, it's well recognised, it's a validated questionnaire. Um, but you know how hard it is to get these things integrated into practice. <laughs> because what what we know, as I said yesterday, for people that are new to the sector, new to the experience, it feels very helpful. But once you've kind of got used to it and you've got a way of working, like driving a car, it feels a bit of a burden to always be checking yourself. But I think for the teams that are doing the work, it's a very important um, thing. Very straightforward. Um, 
you know, a question, what is your understanding of your relative's illness? Um, having time for yourself in the day, you know, is this, Im do you have any, is this important to you? So it's very simple stuff. Have you got legal issues, financial issues? Um, so it's all the stuff we've been talking around, um, which is very, very important. And what was the same Yeah, because you work with Melbourne City Mission. Well as being oh, sorry. Um, we, when we go to do our initial assessment, we, in the folder that we have, we show the carers that this is this is here, and for them to look at and fill in by the time that we come and do the second visit. So we're not expecting them to fill it in right there and then under pressure. They've got the time until the second visit, um, and when we go in on the second visit, that's when we talk through the CSNAT uh, with them and see what help we can provide for them. You be thinking for your GPs, if you, if you gave a copy to a carer and said, next time that you come back, um, bring this, fill it out, have a, have a think, and then we'll go through it because, I'm, because you know, you don't have much time in one consultation yeah. to be um, going through that. And then you could just go through the highlights of what, what's causing the most difficulty at the next session. So it, you could target it in your consultation. Yeah. So you quickly get to what the issue is. Because um, it's got to be practical, otherwise you guys won't have time to do Yeah, something. yeah. But that's, it's a very, I think it's a very useful, it's one of, the, one of the few of many tools that I think is actually really beneficial. And certainly from staff working in the sector, it, it really helps them to feel like they're really helping the right people at the right time. Yeah. And also the carers say that because we're taking note of what they feel, not what we think, think. they're feeling. Um, so they really appreciate that. And this is all about orchestrating things. So if they're supported prior to the death, we're hoping from a sort of public health point of view that their grief and loss will be more sort of in the normal context rather than pathological context. I guess that's kind of really what people are trying to, to do and have shown. There are other tools and these are things really just to give a bit of completion. You can take a bit more detail. The, as I say, I think just getting the carers to articulate. There are certainly um, psychosocial type of tool assessments, uh, which we won't go into. There's also for some people, you know, we, we don't necessarily, some people don't really understand what spirituality <coughs> might be. And you may, you may not necessarily have thought about what your own kind of spirituality or spiritual kind of well-being is and existential. But really, Sometimes it might be useful to use prompts because often people will say if they belong to a particular faith or something, they'll say that's my spirituality, but actually there's other stuff going on that they've maybe never thought about. But sometimes it's useful in the setting as well, but I don't want to overburden. It's just to give you an idea that there are other things that can be done uh, to understand um, those sorts of things. But also, and for teams that are involved, and this is very much in our hospital setting, in our community setting, and I don't know if Melbourne City Mission uses kind of bereavement risk kind of type things, but there's also a need to think, you know, are there potentials for a risky, difficult um, bereavement? Now, often the consensus of opinion around a multidisciplinary team is in some ways most probably more kind of important, getting to know a patient understanding the dynamics, having a, a, an in-house, it could be a community-based um, kind of MDT, or it could be a hospital-based, but you get to know what the issues are and the push and the pull um, and so forth. So sometimes they sit there quietly in the folder and never get filled in because there is already a consensus around the table about what's going on after a few weeks or a few months. And I think if you've been caring for somebody for a period of time, which is GPs, you are doing. Yeah. You you know who is likely to have complicated grief because you know them well. Yeah, absolutely. And the most probably the thing, and we'll come to this in a second when we start talking, but the thing that most probably count I mean there's a whole lot of things. So this looks at some of the client characteristics, so young, under eighteen, um, other sort of things like that. Um, the actual illness, whether it's sudden, so sudden death can sometimes be very traumatising, 
stigma associated with the disease. So it's interesting, you know, when HIV first came out, that was a very stigmatizing um, situation for many people, you know, not to have that acknowledged on a death certificate. Um, um, the other one now, interestingly, we often get people presenting, as you know, with these unique neurological sudden cognitive declines, so the Yakov Krushfeldt type illnesses, which are rare, but we do get them. We get about half a dozen a year in our service. Um, but there, that's kind of, for many families, it's very difficult to reconcile putting something like that on a death certificate, even though it is the cause of someone's death. So there can be stigmatization. You, some cu cultures, certain cancers are seen in a very negative way. Um, working in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space, you know, um, the sort of um, mythologies around what is causational to a person's illness can be very difficult and damaging. Uh, and that, that takes a lot of sort of cultural kind of awareness sometimes. Um, Oh. Um, sorry, it seems to have died again. I was just going to say as well, because I know talking with Griffith, I know they have a, a high um, suicide rate in Griffith, don't they? So yeah, we've got a high average. Yeah, so these are tools that it doesn't have to be a palliative care patient for you to use these tools. Um, yeah. So if you've got anybody who dies within your practice, you can use them. It seems, though, that the one that most of you has the most kind of relevance, I think, in the sort of modern context of grief and loss, which we'll come to, is actually about the relationship, the proximity and the nature of the relationships, um, particularly high dependency, antagonistic, um, uh, those sorts of, um, or they've had a life that's been, you know, emotional issues, it could be from sort of difficult abuse and physical, emotional, right through to kind of just feeling trapped because of cultural kind of needs to stay in the relationship and so forth. So th it, it feels that actually, that if you're thinking about predictors, it's often those sort of difficult relationships that lead to a lot of shame in the grief and loss and so forth uh, that carry on. Okay. Now this is gonna be very quick and it's not to say, it's just to give you a list and I've put them on in the slide so you can see them because sometimes it's, it's the broad brush strokes. People need information, people need information. Now I mentioned earlier we had a, one of the projects that your PHN had, similarly we had funded for a three year project to develop this particular web-based um, carer help. And really it goes through about four different stages of what care help might mean in the early stages, the late stages, uh, sort of after death. But it also answers a lot of questions and helps to give a, um, a sort of pathway in to find other information, local information and so forth. Um, and there's a couple of those gateway type um, areas where this is another Commonwealth one for the carer gateway. This tends to be more around chronic illness management rather than deterioration towards death and dying um, and so forth. So again, I'm not gonna spend time on these, but just to say, and again, in the modern era, having these things feels like a bit overburdensome at times, but what we're trying to do with our one is to unpack that burden. So our next project, which we've had funded, is to actually try and distill this so that people can operationalize it in their local community with their particular illness uh, at their particular age. Some discriminators that you can plug in the numbers uh, location and kind of see what's available more locally for people rather than have to trawl through multiple websites to kind of get the information. Um, by the time you get over the disabled, the kind of this illness group and stuff like that, it can be very confronting and again, as we're finding in the VAD space, a lot of people who are kind of, you would expect at this stage to have some savviness around computers and smartphones still don't have um, experience in this space. And it seems very daunting, you know, to step into this space to search websites. Now, sometimes it's very basic stuff that people want to know about. It's not, 
It's not the it, sometimes it's really just to understand what the whole advanced care planning thing is about. You know, these people that have heard about it, the community groundswell around advanced care planning for us is much greater than the organisational and hospital and healthcare professionals <laughs> kind of role. Even though now in Victoria, most really like New South Wales, it's legislated in law that we have to pay attention to these things. Sometimes it's very much around the urgency to get wills done and powers of attorney. You know, we flag very early to families about wills and powers of attorney. Um, and that's, that can be a difficult conversation because it means it, really we're thinking that dying is kind of more imminent. And the closer it's getting, the more we're sort of, we're the ones getting anxious. But sometimes it's very basic stuff carers need to know about. It's, not, it's, it's the nitty gritty of kind of what life is all about, really, when people are facing. And again, there are a number of these things like will kits. Sometimes it is all about understanding, you know, what benefits they may have. And that's not in a, a way, it's benefits that are due to people when they're a carer, people are on pensions. You know, there are things that are available for carers to support them, even though it might be a little bit of money. Um, but how often people forget to sort of raise these issues with um, people and particularly help after the death with the funeral if you're both on pensions and um, connected to um, the carer benefits. There is some payments still for to help out in the funeral after that or to continue the pension. As you know, if two people are on a, a joint pension, the pension is continued for a number of weeks after the death and then it drops down to a single person's pension. So these are sort of social things that people don't necessarily understand but need, need to know about. And so there, there are all these things that can kind of help. And then there are things, and again, um, there are things particularly if families have got legal issues. And as we know, I mean, I don't know if you've had to employ lawyers um, <laughs> any stage in your life, but they are bloody expensive. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so people may not be aware that um, the cancer councils of each state offer pro bono legal advice and aid to people under various kind of circumstances um, uh, in the can. So that those services are available. Um, and it may only be a few hundred dollars as well ongoing, but often they will provide that support to get people engaged and to provide those services. So I think it's, it's worthwhile knowing about these things. And sometimes it is just finding the carer support around them. You know, you may not know what's available locally. You may not know what's available more distantly. But I think it's very important to understand. I was just going to get this given because I think all the things you mentioned in there, this is a wog of things that oh, contains all of that. So. Yeah, actually, I read this. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, did they, everyone get a copy to, uh, uh, during? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, it's really good. I thought, I've, I'm, I, that's the one thing I'm taking away to say, aren't, why aren't we doing something like this? Um, it's really, really good. And I love the bits about, you know, what to do after hours, what to do. It gives really practical advice where you can get that help. Um, and so, oh, yeah, and no, I think it's fantastic. So, well done. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, it's a bit hard to remember all the things yes. you there. Yeah. You can look it up. So this local area, but, but a lot of those national things are in there. So even yes. though uh, Griffith Lake and somewhere else, yes. you can still access it. Yeah. Now, this is a relatively new thing that you may or may not be aware about, the gathering support. So this is about the carer or the patient um, bringing people together and sort of scheduling in. This is the bit of the modern day. It's not writing it in a folder. But being able to um, kind of bring people together in a supportive way and the things that they might be able to help you with and stuff like that. So this is kind of a more modern take. Again, it's on an app as much as um, on the web as well. And this, the people use these things. Here it is, gather my crew, gather my crew. Um, so empowering, it's empowering. But somebody has to raise it at some point. And also there's another one here, which I've actually used, we use this at work quite a bit, gathered here. It's actually to give you a bit of a, it's a bit like the apps that tell you which are the better places to get petrol from. You know, better pricing, this 
So this actually, are people, have you people heard about this? This is a national, um, so it helps people navigate the vagaries of the funeral industry to find out the sort of funeral they're looking for, where might be kind of more um, better pricing, better things that fit. People want strange things now in their funerals. People are being put into strange things. People are being melted down and kind of dissolved now. They're not just being cremated or buried, you know. It's kind of, but people are taking a very ecological kind of uh, approach to, and, and these funeral, so this is the clearing house to sort of find, because, you know, sometimes you don't know these things. Um, and people just go down the tried and true route, but they, there are other things available um, that might fit their kind of value system. Um, so we use that at work to help families n negotiate with. So it empowers families to do the negotiations, I guess, rather than just leave it and then just go with what somebody else might recommend and so forth. Okay, well, I might skip over those. Okay, so we're just going to change tact and move into the grief um, uh, space. So I guess what I'm, do people need a quick break or is happy to keep going? Keep going? Okay. We'll try and finish by nine. So, um, so I, I, there's an assumption that we've all been in this space in some shape or form. Um, you know, we've all had people die around us. Sometimes that's significant. Sometimes that's um, uh, not so much. Sometimes the grief, we don't really understand where the grief has come from. We don't understand what's touched us about circumstances. It could be, yeah, as you know, for people of my generation, it was the death of Princess Diana or something. You know, we, grief can be expressed and you don't really understand why that's touched you. Um, but often it's the people proximal to you, you know. Um, and again, I can recount very clearly the sort of 12 months after my partner's death um, of that process of stepping back every three months and realising that things had started to shift and change over the three, six, 12, uh, uh, nine, 12 months. My mother died about two years after um, uh, my partner died and there was, like, partner dying was like this, but then the context was that even though the grief was there, it was very different. I, I, you know, having two experiences of kind of loved ones die, the grief was kind of like this. It was like a kind of a little circle and balloon rather than the big circle. We had, you know, and it was just the nature of the relationships and so forth. But it was interesting to be able to sort of then compare my emotional reactions and issues that cropped up in relationship to that. Subsequently, I, last year I had two dog, my two dogs died in quick succession and that was a very difficult, but again, difficult at the time um, and still, you know, the, but the little bubbles of grief. Um, and that's not to say we, we want to go through these experiences, but it, it's useful, I think, to actually see that the process of grieving is a natural integration of those losses. Um, and, I'm, and I'm certainly quite an emotional person. I'm not somebody who sits there ticking off lists of, of things in, in, in an unemotional way. Um, so I'm assuming others have, have gone through these sorts of things. And um, I think, you know, obviously, I think the grief that a patient feels when they get some significant diagnosis and, um, and where that leads is often sort of uh, also kind of unexplored. And as you know, it's multi-dimensional. It's not a one-off. We can't know every permutation or combination. Um, and it really is, I think, as we've talked about, very much dependent on how people have lived their lives, how they've examined their lives, how they've um, connected to the person who's dying's journey, and then what legacy has been left in that sort of process. We sometimes meet people, um, and I won't talk about the um, professional group we see it the most in, but they've got quite fractured lives. And not, you know, they've got the two or three girlfriends, or it's usually, it's usually older men with their several partners. 
but they keep their lives very separate. And so watching each of the partners going through their own grief experience in relationship to the knowledge and information that particular person dying has actually given them is quite a unique thing to watch. Um, so, um, so, so sometimes the experience is very much tempered by the person at the center of all of this, and that's the dying person. And it, it's quite tricky, and that doesn't happen very often, but there are certain situations where we do see this kind of um, issues cropping up. So sometimes there can be difficult extremes. Sometimes it, it is up to the um, staff themselves go through. You know, we're not immune to having certain people die on our watch that doesn't trigger these issues. Um, younger people, children, um, uh, having to be instrumental in being present to somebody's death. For me, the, I mentioned yesterday the difficult death in the hospital which I witnessed. That's, that, was, you know, that was not without its emotional kind of response from me as I sort of go around telling everybody about it. But it really is, you know, so I think we have to recognise staff distress in this space as well. And again, we're a little bit more skilled to understand that um, in this place. Okay. Even though um, it's interesting when you watch the history of kind of understanding grief and loss um, and the development of palliative care even, out of the Second World War, Kubler-Ross and really um, Dame Cecily Saunders, who's a sort of pivotal modern palliative care mover and shaker, they really were interconnected. They knew each other. There was kind of these sort of interconnections. But really, this is a very traditional way of looking at uh, grief and loss in a sort of a sequential way. And as we most probably know, um, it really isn't. It's a much more multidimensional, dynamic kind of space. Um, and the grief of now, the grief of the person being lost, may not necessarily be related to the person who's dying. It might be related to the fact that they migrated from a particular country and they left their family behind. So it's more about that that is the grief. It might be about the fact, and this has been from my own personal experience, getting caught in a bushfire and when very young. So often when I hear about stuff like the fires, a lot of grief still comes up to me about the losses of that when I was a child. So I mean, there's, sometimes there are things kind of hidden in the background that trigger the sort of loss, grief kind of responses um, at this time. Um, I think what is, again, as you see over time, are these very simple things that it is around trying to accept the reality of the loss. And again, from a distance, it feels like that is a bit of a no-brainer. But it's a difficult journey for some people. And even I, I talk to our junior doctors when they come on board in the hospitals, the absolute importance of somebody seeing you go through the process of verifying death is so pivotal to some family members. You know, we do get people who don't believe their loved ones died if they don't see that process occurring of verifying the death, saying this person has died. You walk into a room and it's all very quiet and people don't start really grieving until you kind of say this person has died. And it might be three or four hours after the person's died or a couple of hours. But I, I can't overestimate the importance of going through those rituals even if you're a paramedic going into the community or two nurses in the community verifying death, it's a very, very symbolic and important component. Um, also with, with the whole morning, it's understanding the, the pain that grief can cause. And then it's adjusting, adjusting to the world without obviously, and that's a, again, as you can see, it's often not a kick up your heels and it's all over and thank goodness and we can readjust. It's a, it's an emotional kind of social journey. And I think, you know, notion of um, that you can embark on a new life. And I would say for me, in my situation, it was about 12 months. I could really see that I was starting to look outwards again into the world. It was very interesting that uh, reflecting now that that was what I could, I could absolutely see the point where that shifted for me when I was starting to look at that kind of life beyond the life that I'd had and the life sort of forward 
um, in a really meaningful way. Now, so I think, I think what has come out of the last few years is that really it's understanding that grief is a real um, dynamic. It's not just about adapting to loss. There's a lot of stuff going on. And, um, and that's difficult. You know, so, so much variation that you can't categorise everything in this space. And there's a whole lot of stuff around kind of what's going on in the world um, where you can move between a lot of these things and struggles of, you know, uh, life is worth living but having moments of shock and disbelief and tears. It's, it's not a sort of sequential pathway as we, as we well know. Um, and it can affect the way you feel. You know, as I said before, um, knowing someone's dying can be very intimate, but it can be a time when there's lots of laughter and silliness, and, but it can be a time of a lot of tears and a lot of kind of difficult kind of um, stuff. And that can carry on after somebody's died as well, um, depending on the circumstances. Also, I think, most probably, if I could say one thing, and again, your own experiences, if you've ever been told to let go of something, come on, you can get on with it, you know. Um, letting go, using the words letting go, isn't it time to let go? Um, I think if there's one area that I would say, um, it isn't all about just letting go. I, you hear it a lot. I don't know if you feel like you've said those words to others before in the past, but getting someone to say let go, because what you're asking them to do is to break the bonds completely of the person that's dying, died, and what's going on into the future. Um, I think what's most probably a healthier way is to maintain some of those symbolic bonds recollections, discussions, raising it, talking about it. Um, and so there are certain, t and obviously those need to express that may diminish, but it doesn't mean that necessarily those bonds are always, you know, things happen that you remember a loved one for, or circumstance, or things you might have done, or you visit a certain location, um, and so forth. Um, and really though, I think it is much better to understand the implications and the individual sense of identity. Um, often people will move on after grief. They, they re-emerge maybe as the person they think they were before they were even married or together with someone, or they re-emerge. Maybe some of the friends are no longer those connectors. They recognise the importance, but maybe they move on. So there's a re-emergence sort of process kind of occurring. Now this hasn't come up very well on the slide and there's good reason for that. We had problems with the formatting, um, which you did a very good job trying to get sorted out. But, but this is really trying, this is kind of, people. I love stepping into the space of sort of personalities and kind of things, but really it's around some of the things about reconstructing of self. Um, but what is interesting um, is that there's sometimes there are very positive things about the way you appreciate life, you're sense more sensitive, maybe you're stronger, more mature, um, you take care of yourself. Um, this one sort of, there hasn't been a lot of change, but really sometimes there can be these negative ones where it's very, you're sadder and more fearful and more anxious in that space. Um, and maybe it's harder to be close to others to let your emotional guards down. So it's not all in a very, very positive way. It can be some of these negative things can be kind of, but it gives people, this is a way of structuring a bit of grief therapy to talk about these various uh, um, domains. So I think in this, um, so one is about that integration of lessons learned and lessons lost. Um, I, as I said before, from my own experience, the actual dying was quite traumatising because it was dying and I'd never been present to an individual who was so close to me, who died in front, with me and in front of me. But actually it took about three, four months before that sense of 
being traumatised diminished. Um, and I think also um, it really helped though to understand that. So, you know, being maybe a little bit, having a counselling person helping me through that process was very useful just to mirror my thoughts and understanding. And again, as you know, finding counsellors and psychologists and people can be quite difficult in the regional areas, but having somebody to touch base with and reflect as to how they are can be very important. So it's really taking a multi-dimensional approach to grief and loss now, not just a simple mechanistic kind of um, process. But also we need to understand that it's, there's, there's your own system and coping styles, there's your family system of coping styles, and often that can be the, why don't you just let it go, Mum, sometimes. <laughs> um, and then the social, cultural, and I think that does have a big impact on people that look at their culture beyond just their individual way of doing things. Um, I'm all, you know, it's a bit like when you watch there's been a bad trauma on TV and they instantly say, we've brought the counsellors in and evidence shows that's not really very beneficial to anybody other than maybe the counsellors have been employed um, <laughs> to, to do a lot more work. But it really isn't a benefit. It's not allowing those traumas to unfold. My relationship to the bushfires that I went through, I didn't really understand that that was a traumatising event, even though I was a little kid and everything. Um, it wasn't until, I think I read, um, the, people may not have read this book, it's Richard Flanagan book, uh, um, The Narrow Road to the Deep North or something, the, the one about Burma Railway, and that happened to be when they returned, because I grew up in Tasmania, so when they return from that trip, they go back to Tasmania and they get caught in the same bushfire that I was got caught in. And that, provo that provoked a very difficult emotional response for me. If that was my first time I'd really, this is like 40 years later, or 50 years later, recognise that there was some deep trauma that this bushfires had caused me. And so that was empowering to start to unpack that because obviously it was influencing me around this time of the year when the heat goes up and the, you're in Melbourne and you get these 42 degree days and the wind's blowing, you know something bad's happening somewhere else. But I've been able to reconcile that finally. Um, so not, and again, that's just recognising the issue and, and the problem. And I think this happens. So the degree of grief and loss isn't always in relationship to the loss of the person who's died with them. There could be many other things that it's relating to. Um, recognition that maybe they're going to die soon as well, recognising that their life has taken a journey very different to the one they ever expected, um, particularly around, you know, maybe this was an arranged marriage that was never happy and they moved to Australia and they preferred to be back in their country of origin. So those sorts of things. Um, maybe they were expecting to have grandchildren, but no one in their family's had children. You know, so there's a whole lot of other things that can play out. Maybe they had significant... I know from one family, the mother was never allowed to go to university because she had to look after all her siblings when her mother died. And really her grief around the death of her partner was all about that complete lost opportunity back, you know, 40, 50 years ago when she wasn't allowed to go to college or something like that. So you, just, you need to be savvy that if grief is seemingly very overwhelming and not starting to find its way back into in reintegration. You need to be thinking a bit broader uh, in these sort of settings. And I think this is quite a useful way that it's, you know, people don't feel people are listening to their grief experiences. Um, so sometimes there are relationships that can't be mourned of loss. You know, again, I mentioned a little bit flippantly about the person with different relationships. Um, sometimes there are relationships Sometimes there are things unexpressed, the things that patients tell us, and I'm sure maybe tell you as, as GPs, or that they've never told anyone else before they die. Se serious social problems, um, sexuality issues that they've never expressed. Um, there's a whole lot of things that people feel they want to be heard about. And so 
that may also relate to the, the person themselves um, who's going through the, the grief um, and never had an opportunity to mourn these things. Um, but I think the un, unknown, you know, the relationship issue when there's been other relationships, people come forward. I know a friend of mine, um, her husband died, and two step two um, step brothers turned up that no one in the family had ever known about. Um, so sometimes there can be kind of really difficult things that crop up that I'm open a sort of Pandora's box to some extent. Disenfranchised grief is that the as I mentioned the relationship's not recognised, the loss isn't acknowledged, and that the move on the move on bit the. Um, and things like that. Um, the griever excluded. It's still, you know, in this day and age, you still get, uh, you know, a family might take control of a funeral, not the loved one that's most proximal to that person. Um, and also the circumstances around the death itself, um, that, 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 that people have been excluded. One of the things we have a lot of problems with, you may not be exposed to this, but we look after the prisoners who die in our prisons in Melbourne. They come, we've got a prison ward, we get them out onto the palliative care unit. As soon as somebody dies, the prison guards have to lock off the room. Um, and it's just part of, because it's a coronial thing. But if we don't prepare the family for that, they find that very difficult because they're often pushed out of the room at the time of death. And it needs about half an hour, and then they can come back in again. But if we don't warn them that that's gonna happen, it can be a very difficult problem. If you don't warn somebody that their loved one's death is going to be a coroner's case, um, we're very rigid about making sure we know about that because people think, you know, if the police come to the door, somehow there's been a crime. Um, and if you don't pre-warn people that when there's a coroner's that it involves police and the ambulance in the community or their ambulance, but it also in the hospital involves them as well. Um, so. So that really can be a problem around the circumstances. I think the community's looking at them, thinking that they've done something to their loved one. Um, so they're very, very, it can cause great trauma. And again, I think it's this sort of tussle and ta tag between the oscillations of um, what people are going through and reintegrating and allowing that to happen. It, it does happen for the majority of people in a sort of integrated way. It's why palliative care services stay involved for this 12, 13 month, because they recognise the majority of people do reintegrate to some extent during that period. Um, and actually the, the number of people who have complicated grief uh, is much lower than you'd expect, pathologising grief. Sometimes people do need a bit of a kick with antidepressants initially sometimes if the anxiety and and, and distress is so high, it's really stopping their sort of functioning. Um, but, and that could be a short-term um, boost in a sort of medicated way. But this is where you need the people around to try and support that process and not leave people on their own. Um, I've got a question. Yep. Typically at the sort of six, they used to say at the six-month mark, that was like the important time to Bereavement risk assessment point because if the cracks were going to start showing, it was sort of about then. So if a GP's was thinking to try and book, you know, bereaved care is in ahead of time, yeah. is that still the thinking, that six month mark to really I think I think it's, it's a good gauge, I think, because yeah. you can explore a little bit about what life is starting to mean for them. You can kind of, they can start looking back as well as looking forward, I think. The, yeah. So I. I there's an, yeah, there's, yeah, and again, that could be part of their health check, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yep. Yeah, I think I think that sort of thing is quite useful. And they may be seeing you already in a regular way, but to actually have something just to focus on that is most probably an important part. Um, we do flag the traumatizing grief gets flagged pretty early if it's going to happen. In the, I mean, again, I mean, we've got very skilled people working with us who can identify these things, but. Um, in a regional area where you don't have as much of those supports, it is reliant on maybe the GP to take a lead in that space. And of course, there are people that are very resilient in this space. Um, 
So we meet them. You know, if you know a patient, you know how resilient they are already. Um, these are people that um, do seem to take, they, and, and they find great memories, you know, you often hear those lifestyle shows from America where they say, well, here's a, we've bought the house to create memories for the future. Um, but these are, um, they, they do step away with very, you know, these are very positive sense of resilience in this place and space. Now, this, and this is the difficult part. This is the very difficult part. How do we know when people are tipping into um, depression? Um, and again, it is knowing the person and the patient. It is knowing that maybe, maybe their personality is such that they've had previous episodes. It's, it's kind of knowing. Sometimes this is difficult to um, find out. And as I said, the, uh, kind of the predictor, the, the difficulty of grief is very much focused on relationship issues prior to the death. It seems to be the, the common factor. Um, and so sometimes there was an assumption that um, it was just difficult grief. But it's most probably the thing that kind of, if people are have prolonged or difficult or um, problems of um, you know, emotional instability, um, family are worried, um, the person's life is sort of unfolding, Things aren't being done in the way that they would normally do, as you said, three, six months later. Um, it's often most probably this that's the thing that it's focusing that maybe they're moving into the uh, areas of depression. And this is most probably where, you know, at least a stabilizing utilization sometimes of antidepressants might happen. Some people who are in that space, and again, you guys would know better than others. Um, sometimes it's not, but there is something about conflictual relationships prior to death that has a predictor that depression may be part of the, it's having an antenna for it, most probably um, is, is the main thing. So it is interesting to say, and again, I don't think there's any hard and fast rule around this. Um, and often there are these issues that play out. So the difficult relationship um, often talks about pre-loss dependency. They're very dependent on each other. Uh, in this sort of space of their relationship. Okay, so just kind of in summary, I'm gonna, we'll give some time for a bit of a discussion. Um, as I said, no one can take away the pain, the sadness. Knowing people are around and can care, you know, I was a bit of a the pragmatist who had the list of people I could call upon um, if, if need be. Um, Having a supportive work environment for me was extremely kind of important, knowing that I could express my grief in front of my colleagues and kind of others around them. And, and in fact, uh, the other doctors that worked with me would say, well, maybe, Mark, this isn't a person you might want to go and see on this ward round. It may, it may feel too much like the way your partner died. So that's really lovely that people take that sort of caring attitude to highlight that uh, um, and so forth. And that was certainly in the first three to six months. Even we had a, a death recently where one of the doctors said to me, do you think this might be a bit difficult? It's very similar to your circumstances. So uh, again, a sense of caring, I think, is really lovely. Neighbours, very caring neighbours. Um, people only knew us by our two dogs walking. I didn't know them, but they knew us and would stop me and acknowledge the death or something like that. So again, that, that's a very kind of healing kind of place to be where even though it always was quite difficult when people talked like that, but it was knowing that, again, this person who died was valued, known, um, and, and we were seen as, a, um, as part of this sort of caring community. I didn't construct a caring community around me, but the dogs were a bit of a conduit to that happening, um, most probably reason 20 to have dogs or cats. <laughs> um, and you can't, really, you can't really kind of fix it, but you can help. Um, and again, it's, it's, a bit, it's not really a tick list, but being present. Again, we talked about the trusted relationship yesterday. The trusted 
medical, nursing, whatever relationship that is, trusted person. Um, accepting the strong emotions and don't keep telling people to let go. You know, it's time to let go. Don't you think it's time to pack that away? Um, giving time, showing that there's a care, caring element. Often, often the way you've demonstrated your care to the person who's died is most probably enough. Being proactive, raising issues, saying to the, the person who's dying or the carer, look, I know this is difficult to hear, but I need to talk to you about this. Or, you know, we are hoping for the best, but I need to just raise the issues of things that are, you know, we need to look about the potential for um, maybe dying to occur. I mean, that sort of caring, proactive role, calling up. So our doctors call up the people who've died on our wards, um, uh, partner or closest relative. Our senior doctors do it. It's important. We don't leave it to our junior doctors to do. It's our senior doctor does it. Because we want them to feel like that person's been valued by us enough to stimulate that sort of call and discussion. So being proactive in these spaces, I think, is very important. And having systems in place, like in the general practice, to be able to notify them when death has occurred um, or something like that. So you can be uh, engaged. You may even wish to a acknowledge that or go, you know, some people want to go to funerals and be part of that. They might be part of the community. A significant palliative care person, unfortunately, died just last week in, and, you know, didn't just affect the corridor in the Wagga region, but affected Albury, Wodonga, right down to Melbourne. This person was very well known in the palliative care sector. So I think we've all had an opportunity to express that sense of loss and, and talk about our stories about this particular person. And so that's a very good way of dealing with um, those sorts of losses, um, I think. Um, I so I won't touch on that one. Um, <laughs> Um, and just be, yeah, and this is most probably, and this is tricky for you guys, um, because there isn't, there isn't the diversity of people that maybe these people can go to and connect with and see that often we have in, in metro services. But you may well know you have your preferred um, people to refer to, maybe the mental health plan that you can create for this person can allow them to access sort of bereavement counselling, um, counsellors, psychologists and so forth. Um, you know, one of the most empowering things my, the, the counsellor I saw was to say, you know, this is a tragic loss. I mean, just to have that acknowledged was enough to kind of feel like people really understood what was going on for me. And I know this sounds like a platitude, but... Um, this is, you know, a phone call and a visit from the palliative care nurse after somebody's died in the months afterwards can be extremely empowering, um, particularly if they're known in the community and so forth. So it's a very, um, I wouldn't ever underestimate the, the power of that being present to people. I think this is something, sometimes, this is just the last slide, it's most probably you know, share, share it, acknowledge your own experience of it. You know, we, we have, I mean, I had not, until my partner died, I'd really not experienced sustained kind of loss of relationship grief. Um, but it's been very, it's been very useful to be able to help. Occasionally, when I've met colleagues who are going through the same thing, to actually tell them a bit about that story, to say, you know, even that sense that things will um, things will get better, um, I think it's very important. But not, not this, not putting your own sort of world view, but using the experience to kind of broaden the discussion uh, and so forth. And so I guess what we're looking for is to try and find those opportunities to reintegrate. Now, like everything nowadays, there's an app. <laughs> And I have to say, so we're very lucky in Australia. We have the Australian Centre for Grief and Bereavement. Now, you may have never heard of it. You may have never seen it. Um, they're based in Melbourne, and they're federally funded to 
work in this space. They do a lot of work over the years in the bushfire type environment. So it's not just about grief of the loss of a loved one, it's about events that occur around Australia. But I, I think I've pointed out a couple of apps. I have to say this is exceptional app. This is a really great app. I don't know if anyone's used it. It's only relatively new. Have you downloaded it? I've got it on my... I've downloaded it. Yeah. Chris was saying last week because uh, Chris, who's the... Um, Head of the... Yeah. Of the centre, um, teaches on the specialist certificate. And he was saying that it's, it's available here in the United States, in America. It's yet again another Australian... Invention that's... that's but what it does, it's really good because it asks you about your own grief, like you, as in maybe the clinician, to understand your own grief and grieving. But it gives you really basic steps on how to support people. Um, and again, I show people it. Um, it's a very useful... I, I took the, we have a, um, a workplace Facebook it's not. It's run by Facebook. It's called Workplace okay. Workday Workplace no, Connect. Yeah, okay. So it's really good to be influential across our whole national system. You know, Sydney, Melbourne, out in the regions in New South Wales, where all the St Vincent's healthcare services and aged care work. And this is one that I put on our national kind of you know eight thousand employee type because I think it was so important to help people understand their own. Grief, grieve, grieving, particularly around work stuff when, you know, people die or people leave or, you know, those sorts of things, your own life, but also to help us be more present to people that are grieving. So, so I have to say it is actually, a, it's a good, it's a good resource um, and something that's taken a while to develop, so. And up here in New South Wales, you also have NALAG. Mm. Um, so they have offices in varying areas of New South Wales, so they're not completely in the office. No, I'm not. <laughs> I know there's one in Dubbo, because my friend works there. <laughs> but, but that's another resource. Yeah. 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 But again, increasingly people are finding online, I mean, again, it may not feel like it's your generations, but people are finding benefit in utilising on online chat rooms, online grief and loss spaces. Um, the caring communities often can have an online kind of presence. So it doesn't all have to be face to face. Um, a lot of the work at Swinburne University in Melbourne has been around these sort of um, online um, chat spaces to deal with psychological, kind of psychiatric, but also grief and loss issues. So there are sort of creative ways to um, work in this space. So even though the preference would be face-to-face, -face, I think, when you try to express these things and be acknowledged, for some people, uh, this may be the, uh, the way of the future, that it's, um, you feel more acknowledged by a computer algorithm than you do by personal interface. <laughs> Yes. Is, um, death and digital media. Yes. So um, the way people mourn in digital media, you know, some yes. gamers have been known to have funerals within a game for a famous game. Yes, they place an avatar within the game and yeah. the, the avatar's there for perpetuity, it sort yeah. of lives on. Um, so these are new things that people are doing now. And in um, Facebook now, it asks you on the settings, it will ask you, do you want to look after your Facebook page when you die? Yeah, yeah. I've already set mine up. Mine's my daughter. I'll, I'll look after yours, Mark. Pardon? I'll look after yours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is it disturbing? That might be a post from someone, a friend who's died. Yes. Who <laughs> pops up and you're like, oh, you weren't expecting it. <laughs> so, so that really is all, I mean, bring it together a little bit early so people can get to their workplaces. Yeah. Um, Hopefully that's been helpful, useful, just raising the issues. I think the carer assessment stuff is important. That 
Um, and I think exploring the grief stuff for yourself. Yeah, you could text someone to you in, your, in an email to mm. you like that. Yeah. Yeah. There, great. Mm. Good. Well, it's the beginning of the day. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the lightest. It ain't sunrise, that's for sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much for another really informative session. Thank, thank you, you very much.